Um, I'm actually very grateful to be here. Uh, I'm a very uh, loyal WorkTech uh, enthusiast and supporter. <laughs> I was first sitting as a pupil uh, back eight years ago, taking it all in, and now we're here back to uh, play back some of our experiences. Um, let me start by uh, introducing uh, myself. Um, I have had the pleasure of working in the IT industry for 37 years. Uh, and worked with a couple of companies in consulting, in personal technology, and so forth, some carriers. And uh, in, in doing so, I've been privileged that I've been using mobile technology very early on. My first uh, mobile uh, computer was in 1984, a compact desk pro, 14 kilograms. So that was like exercise in its own right. I was very uh, soon after with... Um, with, with Wang Laboratories, Office Automation, then we had the first mobile phones from Nokia. I launched the first smartphone with Sony Ericsson in 2001, just after 9-11. I remember those days. Uh, people wouldn't fly to London in those days. And uh, now I'm with a, a headset company. So for me, I've been privileged that I had all of these liberating instruments. And therefore, the question has become, if I have all of this freedom, how do I apply myself? So the big questions have been, where and when are the best places to work? And I'll tell you, for me, my most productive uh, moment of work is on a Sunday morning. There are studies published that good managers typically live uh, in the 18 hours to come. And I felt for, long, for a long time that Sundays were very annoying for me. I was very restless because I had to get up to speed. So I'm using Sunday mornings in between 6 and 10 o'clock to summarize the week, be grateful for what we've done, thank you to people, and to summarize and prepare the week well. This is me looking at my garden in Belgium. I think looking at a piece of landscape is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I've also found that landscapes for me are very good for creativity. This is uh, a view from the uh, from the, the Santa Cruz Beach Hotel, where our headquarters is in California. And because of the time uh, difference, you wake up uh, early in the morning, this is the sunrise, you may not see the surfers there because they actually go into the water at the dark and want to enjoy the sunrise as they look for the next wave to come up. I've been doing some of the most creative work, getting up in the morning and watching the balcony on a weekday kind of uh, morning. So that's fantastic. Uh, I must also say that I never skip a moment for a break breakfast, we had breakfast this morning, or yesterday evening we had a nightcap, we had a nightcap, and, and I, mean, so I like being with people because I think that being together in a prolonged time for a good uh, eating session, be it half an hour or, or even longer, is, is absolutely fantastic. At the same time, I've experienced that there's a lot of places that suck in terms of working, right? I mean, a lot of people are ready to commit suicide for the next conference call these days, and, uh, and I just am getting sick and tired of it too. Hopefully the link room systems, which we've just implemented, are going to change that in our company. Um, I also um, really hate being in traffic jams. I cannot imagine the amount of years that I've been in traffic jams. And I, I have a new sport. It's trying to avoid traffic jams. I never travel when there is uh, traffic and just anticipating traffic jams is one of my sports. Um, so uh, unfortunately, these questions uh, are answered by most employers already. They basically say when you're employed, your location of work is going to be there and you will be working 9 to 5, period. Yeah? And mind you, in Germany there's still quite a bit of that. I'm well informed. Yeah? So, uh, but, but I think that's what we really need to change. And I think for me, I started to get answers to this when I first uh, went to WorkTech in 2005. I remember, as Philip was saying, we, I brought along Nicholas Zenstrom, which at that time was in charge of uh, Skype. He sold it on to Microsoft at the meantime. And um, it was just, uh, uh, I think, a couple of years later that I was invited by Vitra, the uh, furniture design manufacturer from uh, Switzerland, to participate in a piece of research, which was called the... Uh, work topology, or geography of work, as I call it. And I was asked to reveal, because I had the degrees of freedom, where I was doing my work. So I was actually opening my kimono of my work topology. And in return, I was uh, uh, given uh, a free attendance to the report that was published. It's called the topology of work. And it identifies seven information work behaviors that we typically have in white collar work. And that for each of those, there's an ideal place to work in. And I said, wow, this is very interesting. And I'm very curious by nature. And before embarking on the implementation in my own organization, I wanted to 
learn about best practice. So I asked the, the researcher, actually the research, give you a couple examples, says that creativity, which is one of the seven work behaviors, cannot happen in the conventional work environments. You need to have an element of a catalyst, and the catalyst is either visual, like here, it can be music or it can be kinetic. Yeah? So therefore, officers are killing creativity. This is me, uh, two and a half years ago, sitting in uh, the Lago d'Orta in the north of Italy, watching the uh, Isola di Silencia, yeah? and I'm sitting there with my wife on vacation. This is a Tuesday lunchtime. And I'm saying to my wife, wow, look at this landscape, it's absolutely fantastic. And she says to me, you've got a problem with you. I said, what do you mean? She said, I've been looking at you, you've been working already for the last half hour. But I cannot switch off my brain. I just, she said, here's a little paper, write it down, call your boss in California, and tell him that you need two more extra days paid by the company. I said, yeah, I understand what you're saying. But the point is that offices are not very creative. I mean, the study also said that you must provide for relaxation and contemplation spaces. Human beings are not designed to work two times four hours. It's impossible. So forget about having your Pilates session early in the morning before work. Have the Pilates session on the top of your desk if you want to do that. Uh, we also realize that a lot of people are basically saying the office is dead. Forget it. Uh, it's not true. A lot of people need immersion, training, education, and so forth. And therefore, new generation smarter officers are there to do that. A lot of us in the room are in that business. So don't panic. I mean, we're not going to work all from home. There's plenty of new offices to be redesigned. Uh, so that means effectively that my recommendation to my people is get out of the office when it's the right time to do it. At the same time, hurry back in because for a lot of uh, areas it should be fun. I mean, why not have a fireplace in the office, right? I think we're designing a new office. I would like to have a couple of fireplaces. Why can we not have them in, in the office space? Yeah? So um, I, I started to feel uh, what was going on and I said I had this new study which was looking at benchmark companies which was called the topology of work catalyst for change and it said the study very interesting 150 pages that yes technology is the enabler and spaces need to be reconsidered but it basically said the big problem is human beings and the team dynamics and what the managers do with uh, their employees and it was all about trust and uh, we basically say these days that the rocket fuel for smarter working is trust. It's not a fluffy word, it's 13 behaviors that have to be lived every day. And it starts by 100% default, unquestionable trust that you start off with and you can only have it go down, unfortunately. And uh, so that's what we're using. Um, so then uh, the shit hit the fan, we had the economic crisis 2008-2009 and I had to uh, reduce my head count because my revenue was dropping by 25%. So I had a bit too much space in England and we had to rationalize three spaces in to one. Yeah? I had never done this before, and we wanted to do it using all the other in, uh, expertise that we had from the studies. So I used a new uh, survey technique, which has been used by people like Louis Lust at this very moment, the Least Man Survey, which is an employee workspace satisfaction survey. It's web-based, and all the employees, not just the managers, are asked, what are the people doing? Are they happy with it? What is the next thing they're going to do about it? Uh, I had an appalling score for 350 people across six office locations of 65 on a scale of 100. I had one out of three people saying to me, I would never take uh, my, my family, my friends, nor my customers to the office because it's so damn out of date. I got people in Hurt in Germany here. Half of them said we're going to leave the company because we kind of do our inside sales job because we make so much noise in inside sales that the other people in marketing say we cannot work on our spreadsheets. So we had a lot to do. This is the kind of report that we got, you can cut it by age group, by location, by, by gender, and basically within one week we had the briefing document for HR, IT, and the space guys to get to work on. Uh, thank God, last minute I got another wonderful contribution by uh, Jeremy Meyerson, which is not with us today, I mean, often he's in the, in the events too, and Jeremy published this book, which is very actionable, New Demographics, New Workspaces, which is focusing on the aging world population, which by European Commission standards is 45 plus. If you're 45 and then you have problems with your eyes or with your ears and the number one problem in most offices is acoustics because most office designers don't know what acoustics are about. That's the reason why we keep on designing great glass, steel, wooden floor kind of things and if you walk around on it with your stilettos you've got a problem because you get disturbed. So the professor said in the book, let's make it simple. You've got four types of acoustic zones that you can look at. The most important things to look for now is concentration. Yeah? and make sure that all these people which need to make a lot of noise with their voices for tech support and support and selling they need to be 
closed off and we applied all of this in our office. Yeah? So I'm not talking about technology, I'm working in a technology company. For us, unified communications is the ingredient. It's mobile unified communications. We've had this with Skype already in 2005 because it wasn't anything at that time. I we were using various types of technologies. But what we felt very clearly and inspired by, I would say, the Dutch, the Dutch uh, I would say, uh, leadership uh, in the country is that three disciplines need to be combined. So we've always said that we wanted to combine space, bricks, bites, and behaviors. And, and actually, but, but I wanted to have one throat to choke in my organization. So I decided that the people in HR would do it. They were not waiting for it. They said they had plenty of other things to do, hire, fire, train, competencies, employee engagement. And we decided to change the name of HR from human resources, which is input, into human realization, what you get out of it. Our view is that only 10% of the potential of human beings is being used these days, and we've got to create conditions to make it better. Uh, so. Um, we launched the office with all the inspiration of the people that we met at WorkTax and uh, we launched this acoustic temple on uh, June 2011. Yeah. And um, we did a post-occupation survey with Leesman, surprise, surprise. And we shot up from 60, sorry, from uh, 65 indeed to 84. And we were immediately the most satisfying workplace in, in, uh, in the UK and Northwest Europe. Uh, some people said, wow, you're doing some interesting things. You should apply for an award. So we uh, put in an award. Uh, submission for the British Institute of, uh, of uh, Facilities Managers and we won it for innovation and impact on the organization. We had a feeling we were walking on water. Now we have like everyday people coming along. I mean, the gentleman from Rolls Royce visited us uh, just uh, last year and was very inspired about what acoustics means in his office. So, um, and, and we, we have this definition of smarter working which is based on this trust idea. We basically say smarter working is a new management philosophy whereby you're treating adults as they should be dealt with. You give them the freedom to choose time and space, you tell them results is more, most important, save money for us, respect the planet, right? And uh, that means that 9 to 5 and these old style offices are gone. I haven't had, I, I do not have an office for six years. I had an office which could accommodate six people, it's ridiculous. I was only there two, two days a month, so I mean, how, how can you justify that? So I basically set a little example for it. Uh, we tell our people, individuals and the managers, that they need to understand the art of work, work space portfolio management whereby rather than like a zombie in the morning, drive to the office, sit in a traffic jam, plonk yourself behind that desk and then wonder what the heck you're going to do, that's not what you should be doing. Every week, every day you're going to be thinking, what are you doing, what's the nature of your work, where you're going to do it, and then you choose where to do it, and nobody has to make any comments around it. Yeah? It's also related to your personality style, of course. So, the problem that we have so far is networking. I would like to contrast with some of what the earlier speakers are saying, networks suck on average, right? So I left the United kingdom uh, exactly six months ago to go and live in Amsterdam. I was walking around on the Big Ben exactly three weeks ago with my wife prior to a long conference call. I couldn't get a bloody signal at the foot of Big Ben. Uh, it was not fun for the customer service desk of the operator. Uh, and by the way, I know what's happening, but I mean, the signal in this room is not very grand either. It was probably scrambled. I've been told this too, because in London, I was living in St. George Wharf next to uh, MI6. So they told me, Philip, the problem that you have in St. George Wharf is that it's all scrambled. You're just in the wrong location. But it also happens when I drive on the M4 from London to Swindon. So there's a little problem on the networks, and that's the Achilles heel. Anybody who wants to work on that, I'll be more than happy to uh, give them some guidance. Guidelines. So, all the results, for those of you who are hard-nosed uh, chief financial officers and asking whether this flower of power brings something in, it does. With us, we've reduced absenteeism by 60%. Absenteeism in Europe is about 9%. Absenteeism is you're ill or you don't feel like you're going to work because you don't like your job. Yeah? Uh, if you reduce that by 60%, that's 5.4% of your labor cost. That will be applauded by your board of directors. Real estate, you can save by 30%. That's, we've done much more over nine years. We've done 54% today. Once that is done, employees are happy. They feel respected. They start to work too much. We've just done an, ac an academic post-analysis of smart working, and the number one problem is work intensification. That's another word for workaholism. I may suffer that too, by the way. So, um, so that's an issue that we need to work on. So, um, because uh, we, in our organization, we had to cobble this together. I couldn't find one consultant uh, that could really help me across the disciplines of HR, space, and IT. So I had to cobble it together the way I could. And um, 
we decided to put it on a piece of paper and uh, I have found Guy who uh, well you're going to tell me what, what happened who was so kind to help me with writing it down because writing a book is, is uh, extremely labor intensive so having somebody who's done it before was my help over to, uh, to Guy thank you very much indeed for that. thank you First of all, I should just make it clear that when Philip says I was very kind to help him with the book and very kind to write the book, uh, it wasn't kindness, there was money involved. Please don't worry about uh, anything from that point of view. Uh, Philip has shown you uh, an awful lot of uh, picturesque, wonderful places where he's worked, places he's lived, uh, places where he's flexibly worked. I grew up in uh, southwest London. I now live in southeast London. So I thought, what can I show you? What can I show you that's really going to visually inspire you, that's going to really sort of show the picturesque areas where I grew up and worked, I got nothing. Okay, um, <laughs> so uh, those of you who know London at all, uh, did anyone been to Croydon? Um, yeah, okay, yeah, you'd be, yeah, so you, you know, okay, so, you know, this is, uh, this is as good as it gets, yeah, I'm just sparing you the details. So I thought we'd talk about my uh, workplaces instead. Um, Left college 1986, my first uh, um, work, I was actually a home worker. I worked for a local charity, I was a home worker. It was in somebody else's home, I will grant you, but I was a home worker based in a charity and that was where I picked up on this uh, first, what has become, I hope, a myth, but in 1986, 87, 88, it was true. Home offices are lonely. We promised you in the uh, program that we would deliver you some commandments for uh, smarter working. The first one is, don't abandon your home workers. You need to support them. I was working for a local charity. Uh, I had, it was a classic uh, mid-1980s thing. I was uh, working at their dining room table. Uh, I probably ended up with a bad back and all sorts of, you know, this is just self-pity. Please ignore me, that's fine. <laughs> it didn't go terribly well. Within a few years, I left to my, uh, my next job. I went into journalism. This must surely be different, I thought. This must be better. You must have more freedoms. You've got to go out. You've got to find the stories. You've got to talk to people, right? Uh, that's just some of the newspapers I uh, hadn't written for. I thought I'd just put, put a generic newspaper picture up there. I did not write about the last election, but I had actually contributed to most of those papers, not The Sun, but uh, Times, various others. Thing is, we were still very much office-based. You turned up at I was going to say 9 o'clock, we were journalists, we turned up at 10 o'clock, uh, we would finish around about 6 o'clock, or rather go to the bar at about 6 o'clock, but we were mostly office-based. Even the, uh, the, the second editor I worked for, even, he, he would even uh, insist people came in, not while they were on holiday over the Christmas break, but uh, while Christmas was happening around you. We were not producing any issues. It was a computer newspaper, it was uh, every week, and uh, sort of mid-December we'd stop producing issues, early January we'd pick up again. Mid-December, the editor would sit there asking, where is everybody? I don't know why I was in the office at the time, but I said, well, we're not producing any issues at the moment, Keith, you know, why would they bother turning up? He said, there will be stuff to do. So this is it. There will be stuff to do because there is an office there. There will be stuff to do when you're not producing anything because there is an office there is a workplace and this is just what we do. That was very much the view. 1993, during the uh, major financial crisis we had, that we felt like a major financial crisis, I know it's just been worse, but uh, we had a, a, a recession and then, as I like to put it, I got freelanced. Uh, I, uh, became, I, I chose to go freelance, uh, is, is uh, what I actually meant, uh, meant to say. And that was when I got my new workspace. I've got to show you a picture of my new workspace. This is very exciting. Um, I love this new workspace. This is great. There you go. That, uh, that's not my actual workspace, don't worry about this, it's just a sort of representation, artist impression thing, I haven't done anything peculiar there. Um, so, it's portable, I, I carry with me at all times, it's, uh, it, it's run out of charge, it needs a bit of uh, reformatting from time to time, I'll grant you that, but uh, mostly, it's pretty useful, and um, that is where I work, that is the way, my attitude, that is my workspace. About the late 1980s, I started to be able to connect it to things. Whoa, we had all these sophisticated bits of technology. You, you probably remember some of these. Anybody have any of these things at the time? Anybody, uh, anybody speak English? No? Okay, fine. Good. <laughs> So, um, you started connecting to those. Of course, 
the, uh, the technology has increased dramatically since then. We've got all sorts of other devices. I'm not going to patronize you by showing a picture of uh, an iPad and things like that, because that's not what this is about. We can all connect, except in here, you're quite right. You know, in here, it's, 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 it's not at all. We're back in Britain, so we've got British connectivity in here. Sorry about that. This is British territories, okay? So, you know, you have your lousy connectivity in here. You are under Big Ben when you step, step foot in here. So we have, um, uh, uh, but I don't really care whether you carry an iPhone or a, um, uh, 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 an Android or uh, one of those, uh, what, sorry, Peter, what were they, um, uh, yeah, one of those things, uh, it's uh, whatever the other, the other things were called. I don't care about that. We can all connect. My old office, those offices should look as derelict as this by now, probably cleaner because of environmental concerns, but they really shouldn't look uh, as, they, uh, 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 as they did then, except people still do work in that way. They still do the classic nine to five thing. They still do the, this is your workplace, this is where you must sit. And you can work anywhere. You know, you can be, uh, there's a whole variety of workplace. Philip's talked about the, um, spoken about the, uh, the whole portfolio workplace management thing. That's how we should all be working. Um, and yet, as knowledge workers at least, and yet we don't seem to. I can work anywhere these days. Uh, I can, I'm, I'm working now. I was working on the plane on the way over. Connectivity not good in planes either. That's a little thing they could work, they could work on, but the Illinois the pilots when you activate Bluetooth and things like that, fair enough. But I can work absolutely anywhere. And that's a picture of, it's not me in a meeting, but uh, I don't know who it is in a meeting, so it's probably Philip, I don't know. But uh, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you can work absolutely anywhere. One of the things I do in journalism is a thing called Unified Communications Insight, ucinsight.com. They asked me to go and see Plantronics just to write a case study. I went there, I saw the acoustic temple, as Philip uh, humbly puts it, and uh, I was absolutely stunned. They really, really walk the, t walk the talk, walk the walk, walk the talk, talk the walk, whatever they do with that uh, phrase, that's what they do. In, if this ever happens to you on stage, just carry on. No, 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 just don't worry about it. Um, they, um, uh, they absolutely uh, push this stuff. They absolutely live it. I thought, this is inspiring. I want to write about this. I said, would you help me with the book? They said, yes, we'd help you with the book. So I started putting it to publishers. They weren't interested because they just didn't get it. The publishers themselves were also stuck in this nine to five thing. They didn't get why you want to do anything different. Philip was out of the country at the time. I didn't meet Philip uh, on that occasion, but then something happened. Here's a happy couple. Philip, uh, uh, through his PR uh, agency, uh, well, Philip wanted to write a book about smarter working. His PR agency didn't know that I'd been to uh, Plantronics on that occasion, so I just got this email out of the blue saying, would you like to write what was effectively the book that I'd been pitching around to everybody saying, this book needs to be written. I was suddenly very, very excited about this, as I'm sure you can imagine. I, not that we come up with anything dramatically new. That's a picture of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, I hate people who read uh, from um, PowerPoint slides, but I will just read uh, this one. It's a quote that I remember from my youth, not that I was around when Sartre was around, you understand, but I, I read it in a book somewhere, saying, it is insulting to be paid for your time rather than for your actions, rather than for your output. I remember that very clearly. I've Googled it. I can't find a reference to it anywhere. I may have made it up to impress somebody and pretended it was uh, Jean-Paul Sartre when I was 15. We've all done it. Come on, you know, be fair. But I needed a visual for the, uh, for the quote, so that's Jean-Paul Sartre anyway. It makes me look really swept and interesting. So, there's nothing dramatically new. It's been happening for an awfully long time. And I'd like to round off with uh, this little slide here that uh, reminds me of my youth in uh, South East London. Not that we had mountains. Not that we had, uh, uh, well, sun really, let's be honest. It was, it was, it was London. Um, but just because when I was at, uh, uh, about eight, nine years old, um, we used to have story time at school. And we used to always say when it was sunny, we'd say, please, can we go and do it on the grass, please? Please, teacher, can we go and do it on the... Can we go outside, please, can we go outside? What can I tell you? I'm sorry, we just didn't have these, you know, these lights and things like that. I was nine years old. I didn't know about artificial lighting and stuff like that. It was 1974. Give me a break. Stop picking on me. Okay. So, um, we knew that we wanted to be out there. We hadn't thought through that we were more effective if we were not distracted by the sun outside. We hadn't thought through that we were uh, going to be better listeners if we were uh, went out there, uh, if we weren't in, inside being distracted by the sun outside. But that's what was happening. That was smarter working. We were more effective out there being read to than in there being read to, because that was the best place for us to be at the time. The more switched on teachers were aware of that, and they would take us out there, and we'd have a much better session. That, in a way, was my first experience of smarter working. And we seem to spend the rest of our adult lives uh, actually being, uh, ha having that knocked out of us. 
And I think it's our job as uh, authors of the Smarter Working Manifesto, which I commend to you, and you've got a compulsory copy anyway, so you might as well read it. Uh, we, uh, that, it it's our job to knock that back into us, get that childlike instinct of where we work best and when we work best, and uh, that's what the book's about. Thank you very much indeed. Philip. That was impactful. So, uh, so, uh, sorry. so just, just about the book, for those of you who still want to decide if you want to read it, uh, we've chosen to call it the manifesto because we feel that there is so much available out there by others that is worth uh, putting into place. So we have a strong set of beliefs. Uh, we also feel that it's time for action and to implement these things. So uh, I, I came uh, yesterday from Italy. I don't know how they do this these days, but uh, anybody is Italian here in the room? No Italians? Are you going to Italian? Well, you know what, sir? I have an Italian version for you ready. Uh, it was launched yesterday. I was in front of 450 uh, human resource seniors in Milano, in the Convivio Resort Romani, non Numani, uh, because I don't know why, but in Italy uh, there is some big, big things afoot. And I've been waiting for having uh, HR people in front of me that can take charge and take the duty of changing these things. Um, we, we're going to be actually looking to publish the German version. And the German version I would like to launch in my favorite place in Stuttgart. And uh, we're going to have lunch uh, together, uh, and uh, I think we could do that in September. I'd like to make sure that at the same time we shine on office acoustics uh, out there, and that we also show what wearables can do in connection with your fine environment. So thank you for having that. But I think what I would like to do is to call uh, Mr. Philip Ross over here uh, for a moment, yeah, because uh, I am very, uh, very grateful for how he uh, launched me into this wonderful world of smart working. Would you mind joining me too? Because uh, we're going to make him uh, the uh, evangelist uh, to be part of the Hall of Fame of uh, things. So would you mind standing in front of us here? And he's going to give you the English version. Yeah. There we go. And uh, somebody's going to take a picture. We have people which are doing that, right? <laughs> okay. Take it here. Take it here. No, it's only... So there you are. Yeah. Yep. This is a photo opportunity, by the way, if anybody hadn't uh, noticed. It's, it's, it's blocking you from your, we're blocking you from your coffee, but don't worry about that. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. We look forward for you all to spread the word about the fun doing these things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.